This is Jeff Eisenach. I'm the director of the Center for Internet Communications and Technology Policy here at the American Enterprise Institute and a visiting scholar. Uh, a decision that we've all been waiting anxiously for uh, for many months has now uh, been delivered by the DC Circuit on Verizon v. FCC, the FCC's open internet order popularly referred to as the net neutrality decision. Uh, and we're here to provide some uh, perspective on uh, the decision that the court has handed down and its implications going forward. Uh, with me today are Richard Bennett, Rosalind Layton, and Brett Swanton, Swanson. Uh, we're each going to talk very briefly for just a couple of minutes, and when we're done talking, uh, we hope that you all will ask questions uh, either through text, uh, uh, and uh, we will answer those questions as we receive them. Uh, so. Um, let, let me kick things off. First of all, this is a momentous decision, arguably the most important decision affecting the Federal Communications Commission in the last 20 years or so, at least since some of the decisions that come to mind are Iowa Utilities and Trinco, uh, decisions affecting the basic uh, fabric of how uh, communication services are regulated in the United States. Uh, and this decision will uh, have uh, large consequences going forward. Just to briefly review the bidding, what the court has said is that the basic provisions of the Open Internet Order preventing non-discrimination uh, or requiring non-discrimination and pro prohibiting blocking uh, of Internet sites uh, are not justified uh, by the Commission uh, because it has failed to uh, exercise the appropriate authority under the law. It's what the Commission is, what the Court has said is that while the Commission has broad authority under Section 706 of the Act, and it largely sided with the Commission on that argument, um, it did not side with the Commission on the question of whether it can impose quote unquote common carrier uh, obligations on Internet service providers under se Section 706 as long as those ISPs are classified as uh, information service providers or enhanced service providers uh, as opposed to uh, telecommunication services. So, so that's the basic fabric of the decision. Um, I think uh, just from my perspective, reading the decision, it's clear that we've got a lot of work to do in terms of teaching basic internet economics to the DC circuit. Uh, there's good news and bad news there. The bad news is that the DC circuit largely embraced the FCC's very flawed arguments about the economics of competition on the internet and among internet service providers. Uh, the, the good news is that uh, it did so essentially by default because those were arguments that really hadn't been joined by Verizon in its briefs uh, or in its oral arguments. So essentially, uh, it accepted the FCC's position on some of those issues unopposed. Uh, but we all know those to be, those decisions or those uh, those views are going to get debated going forward. Um, secondly, um, uh, and the Commission did uh, take an expansive view of the, of the FCC's uh, 706 authority. My uh, colleagues will talk, talk about that. Uh, thirdly, and here's what I think the bottom line is, under this decision, uh, the very onerous regulations, potentially very onerous regulations uh, in the open internet order, order will not be applied. Um, and what that means is that at least for the time being, the freedom to innovate that has characterized the internet ecosystem from its early days, the freedom to adopt new business models, uh, to adopt new pricing models, to introduce new uh, forms of uh, communication uh, that um, uh, make consumers better off and that uh, allow for innovation in new services, all of those freedoms will remain. Uh, at least for the time being, since the uh, regulations imposed uh, that the FCC was trying to impose have uh, been overturned. So that's that's my big big picture take. I think it's a good day in that sense for the internet, for innovation, for uh, freedom, uh, and for consumers in the economy. Uh, now let me turn it over to Richard Bennett. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, Richard Bennett. I'm a visiting fellow here at American Enterprise Institute and a consultant and uh, wireless engineer. Uh, I'm frankly was I was very surprised uh, by this by this decision. I the one thing that I did not expect the court to do was decide with the FCC on the question of the 706 authority. Uh, I but they did accept that and and they they only quibbled with the FCC's application of common carriage to uh, a system that they had previously classified as uh, Title One Information Service. So. They faulted the FCC on inconsistent uh, application of their own classifications and rules, but sided with the FCC on the question of, of authority. Which means, I think, that um, 
for the time being, it's certainly correct, as Jeff said, that Internet freedom applies to networks, too. Uh, there are certainly people for whom Internet freedom only applies to applications and, uh, and to consumers. But if it applies to, to networks, too, then, you know, there's room, there's going to be room to innovate with uh, different kinds of service plans and different kinds of business models uh, that can uh, promote innovation in their own right. So the FCC is going to be tempted now to go back and reclassify broadband as a Title II service so that they can impose these regulations. And the, the court basically signaled to them that if they really, really, really think it's necessary to impose uh, anti-blocking and anti-discrimination rules on network operators, what they're going to have to do is reclassify broadband under Title II. And, uh, and I'm certain that at least a couple of Tom Wheeler's staffers are bending his ear today to do just that. And I, I certainly hope that doesn't happen, but uh, I think that's certainly one of the options that the FCC is considering. Uh, all right, uh, Rosalind, you're up. Thank you. I'm Rosalind Layton. I'm a PhD fellow in Internet Economics at the Center for Communication, Media, and Information Studies in Alborg, Copen Alborg University in Copenhagen, Denmark. And I'm also a visiting fellow here at the CICT at American Enterprise Institute. I think what's important to say here, uh, I think that many, for, for many they have wanted to see this decision upheld, but I think what's most important for them to realize is that the Internet it was open before, it's open today, and it will be open tomorrow. That this ruling, this uh, set of uh, open internet report and order, wasn't necessary to keep the internet open. It's a fact of the matter that it's in the interest of operators and internet service providers to support an open internet. That has always been the case. In many ways, uh, even though this may be a loss for the FCC on paper, I certainly would concur with uh, Jeff and Richard, this is really a win for the FCC. And in many ways, it's a clean slate for the agency. Uh, the net neutrality discussion, uh, even Julius Genachowski himself, he called it counterproductive, it has been a stalemate now for a, a decade. We, we're really at an impasse and, and it's been uh, very difficult. And I think the onus falls on us, we've got to do a better job of explaining the economics and I'm, I'm sure we will. But what this means is that the FCC has a clean slate and they'll be back with something else. And uh, to be sure, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I will, I'm Positive, it will include more uh, evidence-based approaches to looking at discrimination in the marketplace. Uh, it can't be, you know, just somebody thinks this is wrong. They really have to justify uh, what's going on. So um, I th definitely will see the FCC will uh, have something else to talk about. Um, but I think basically all the parties are going to kind of go back to the drawing board now and. Um, um, but we'll, we'll refuel and relaunch. It will probably not be net neutrality, but it will definitely there'll be there'll be more more to come. It's not uh, it's not over today. Uh, terrific. Uh, I'll go ahead. I'm Brett Swanson, a visiting fellow at AEI's Tech Center and president of Entropy Economics, a uh, consulting firm we advise investors and technology companies and have been following this debate for the last 10 years. I recalled a, a few months ago that we first uh, prepared testimony for the Senate uh, Commerce Committee on this topic uh, spring of 2004. So this is a, a big decision. As Rosalind and the others have said, the Internet has been open, it's been dynamic, it's been creating wealth and innovation, and it will continue to do so. In fact, we can sit here and talk about this uh, online in this forum is evidence of that. I do think that uh, if you look at uh, Chairman Tom Wheeler's statements over the last couple months, you see that he's emphasized the importance of an open, open internet, and we all agree with that. Um, I think that today's decision giving the FCC basically over all authority over broadband will make him happy in that regard. He gets to uh, say that he will continue to have some sort of oversight over broadband. Um, uh, but Chairman Wheeler has also over the past couple months made some very specific comments about saying he believes that we should allow innovation and experimentation in multi-sided markets 
the various types of markets that arguably this these net neutrality regulations could have prohibited. And um, so the um, court's vacating of the common carriage regulations, I think, is a very good thing for continued dynamism and innovation on the Internet. It really is quite silly to uh, that we would um, impose old phone regulations meant for a monopoly public utility on something uh, like the Internet, which has so many different players and technologies and networks and new firms and uh, a, a multi-purpose network delivering different types of data and different types of services. So that old style common carriage regulation, even though the court didn't rule on the wisdom of it, it got that point correct, saying that that old style common carriage regulation is not appropriate for the modern internet. So the internet's open, it will continue to be, I think we should continue to expect lots of uh, good things from the internet economy. One thing I was struck by, and as a layman, as a non-lawyer, reading through this decision, probably like a lot of uh, uh, court opinions, is just the layers and layers of complex legalese that probably even to lawyers are difficult to understand. You're going back decades and decades worth of different statutes and uh, other court decisions, and it, it was very difficult even probably for the court to tease out, you know, uh, what did Congress mean here, and does it? Does, how does the uh, Communications Act of 1934 interact with the Communications Act of 1996, and so forth? What this basically tells me um, is that it probably is time to uh, rethink communications law in a bigger way, and you in fact see some movement in Congress down this road with uh, two members of the House specifically saying, what should a truly modern new rethink of communications law look like? So that would be my final point. All right. Well, I'm uh, delighted that we've been joined by another one of our uh, CICT senior fellows, uh, Babette Bullock from Pepperdine uh, University. And we can uh, see you're in the home of modern art with your apples behind <laughs> you, Babette. So uh, we, we, we do have a lawyer here to comment on this legal decision, fortunately. So you can you can set us right if we've got it wrong and, and uh, add some lawyerly thoughts um, in any case. Uh, modern art coming to you by modern technology on an open internet, uh, <laughs> which will continue to be uh, so uh, before this decision and after this decision, as Rosalind rightly said. Uh, as you noted, Jeff, I am a lawyer. Um, but I'm also cursed to be an economist. Uh, so when I read this opinion, I look at it with two hats. Uh, both are interested in some dis parts of the decision and uh, perhaps uh, uh, disappointed, but not. Um, uh, I didn't find anything unexpected in it. And let and let me bring it together first, starting out with what you commented on, Jeff. That that. This is definitely, I think, I would categorize as a win for the FCC. Uh, first and foremost, as Richard pointed out, uh, I was not surprised, but again, perhaps a little bit disappointed about the strong assertion of uh, jurisdiction the court found for the FCC over the internet, in particular over broadband providers. Uh, arguably, that is the transmission. Uh, providers, Verizon, ATT, etc. So very limited, very uh, akin to the silo regulation that this act represents, uh, but really gave quite a bit of power. Now that should make uh, some people, perhaps including myself in some regards, uh, content in that the FCC will have incredible power uh, when it sees some kind of uh, intrusion or, or, or blockade to the deployment of broadband services, they will be able to intervene. And that is clear from the court uh, without further uh, work on their part except to justify whatever rule um, they propose with that regard. That said, it's a little surprising sort of the extent of the power that they are seeing in what was viewed by many as a general provision of law, not really giving express uh, powers to regulate. 
But what the court uh, did was say, at least for things like the transparency requirement, the disclosure requirement, uh, that 706 will be sufficient to uh, maintain that and, uh, and perhaps even more ex extensive regulation. What they did not find legally, and I, this is where I sympathize very much with Brett, is that you can't uh, regulate something like a common carrier to which the act specifically talks to. You can't regulate them with that without actually using the provisions that govern common carriers. So when the, the, uh, the FCC order asked for anti-discrimination, anti-blocking, uh, rules through this arcane sort of anal legal analysis, what what the court found was those type of regulations are literally putting them in a common carrier bucket. When you do that, you have to go to the common carrier provisions of the Act. You can no longer rely on 706. Therefore, since you have not done that, since you have not taken all the common carrier provisions by saying that they're a Title II uh, common carrier, you can't, you know, cream, uh, do some cream skimming and pick the provisions that you like. It's an all or nothing. Uh, so that's why the anti-discrimination and anti-blocking have been vacated. Uh, as others have seen, that of course ushers in the possibility for the FCC to go back and recategorize uh, these uh, enhanced services and advanced services as common carriers. Now we've seen uh, for a decade, as Rosalind said, that there has been a movement to reclassify uh, internet provision as common carrier. And this is where my economist hat comes on and, and I feel uh, particularly that this would be a move in the wrong direction for the, the reasons set forth before. Uh, there, there is little doubt though from this that uh, it seems uh, to signal that such a reclassification uh, could be supported by the FCC's current uh, evidence that it, or similar evidence that they used in this, this order. Uh, as a matter of economic policy, I do think that that would be detrimental. We have evidence of that from prior experience with common carrier uh, legislation. And so again, I would conclude by saying with Brett uh, that perhaps it's time to definitively end this 10-year dialogue and revisit in its entirety telecommunications regulation in the country. Uh, well, Babette, thanks for that. Um, and so we now open the floor to questions from uh, the audience via Twitter or Google+. Uh, so if you have questions, please go ahead and send those in and, and we will uh, be happy to take them. The first question we have um, relates to thinking about this in the larger context. So uh, last year, actually maybe it was late 2012, uh, AEI did an event on what was uh, a big international conference coming up in Dubai uh, at that time, unfortunately known as WICKET, um, the World Information uh, Conference on, uh, on Information Technology Conference. And uh, the debate that was going on then, and it's accelerated since, is the debate over international regulation of the internet. And of course, um, many countries, which have still, many of them still with monopoly, publicly owned telephone companies, um, have oh, have wanted to move in the direction of uh, United Nations regulation of the internet, imposing a whole slew of regulatory requirements. And with the NSA revelations, I think that has, has added some fire to, or some fuel to that fire where Brazil and other countries are out arguing that we need to have uh, government intervention, international government intervention to uh, guarantee privacy, to guarantee openness, uh, and so on and so forth. Some of the same kind of themes that we hear from the net neutrality advocates in the U.S. Uh, so uh, I want to toss that out to all four of you uh, and ask, with that in the context, ask this broader question. Uh, which is, uh, you know, how do you see this playing out going forward? How do you see this decision um, playing into this very active debate of international regulation of the internet, um, and uh, if at all? Uh, and where do you see this going from here in terms of either the courts? Uh, Babette, I'm going to let you go first. Either the courts in terms of potential appeal, uh, or um, 
uh, or in, on, in the Congress or otherwise. So, um, Babette, I'll let you go first. Why don't we go in reverse order? So, uh, we'll go Babette, uh, Brett, Roslyn, Richard, and uh, staying brief, of course. Well, I actually think you raise a very interesting point, Jeff. Uh, and I would say as far as uh, I, I know you raised NSA concerns and perhaps sort of privacy concerns. The interesting aspect of this by sort of reiterating that, of course, the there seems to be some kind of jurisdiction that uh, the the FCC has over internet and internet policies and I don't think that's really been uh, a point of contention and now it's been elaborated and solidified in the DC circuit to some extent so in some ways I think it is going to allow the FCC a little bit of uh, assurance that it can speak to some of these issues that uh, in previous uh, iterations it might have had a little bit of caution uh, and I see that at, at its at its best as being a uh, pro-consumer. The advantage a regulator has in instances like this is is how quickly they can respond to to various threats or uh, uh, problems that arise. They can respond fairly quickly, as opposed to other sort of enforcement agencies. Uh, so I do think that there there could be some nice uh, pro-consumer protections that that might be able to arise out of this rather rather quickly as far as actual appeal on this I I, I really don't know uh, uh, that's going to be a legal strategy these are, are usually contentious and expensive to take forward to the Supreme Court uh, etc I would imagine I would have prophesized that that basically the concentration of those who are dissatisfied with the extent of th that the DC Circuit went and the limitations they put on, that they would focus rather on reclassifying uh, co uh, as common carrier these enhanced services. So looking for a Title II reclassification movement rather than trying to get cert. Uh, yeah, with uh, regard to the international questions, I think this and the NSA set of questions uh, raise some sort of fundamental points about where we are in the internet and the US as the you know inventor of the internet and the source of so much internet investment and innovation has a real responsibility I think to be a leader internationally and stand up for free enterprise on the, on the internet, free speech on the internet and, um, you know, you noticed that at uh, Chairman Wheeler's Ohio State speech, which was very good, he said regulating the Internet is a non-starter. I think that was a pretty good um, uh, marker to lay down. Um, I think with regard to the NSA, although I'm, I think that uh, our intelligence uh, capabilities are extremely important in a world of more cybercrime and potential other and terrorist threats and so forth. I think it's also incumbent upon us that our intelligence agencies um, act in a way that gives the uh, the population, the cit citizens, confidence, so that they can continue to support both an open internet, free speech, and support you know intelligence capabilities that are limited. And so, in both of these cases, I fear that. Um, whether it's further regulation of the internet, which Chairman Wheeler says he doesn't support, or some of the NSA possible oversteps, we could be sort of eroding the principles that we say are so important and that we should be, um, you know, following ourselves and therefore promoting around the world. So, Jeff, thank you for an excellent question. Um, you you, you touched upon something which I think is really one of the obvious shortcomings of net neutrality legisla legislation is why don't these rules apply to governments? You know, what we see throughout the, the Western world that there is no pattern of blocking websites and blocking content whatsoever 
But if you go to places like China, if you go to Saudi Arabia, you can go um, even in, um, even in, for example, in Denmark, the government blocks gambling and child pornography websites. So, you know, what I'm interested to see, you know, I have great respect for um, many uh, supporters of net neutrality and a lot of the, you know, some of the work that they're doing. But I think the key deficiency of the rules to date have not looked at uh, what governments can do to their own people and how they can block classes of websites, voice over IP providers. This is not going on by telecom operators or cable companies. So I think that if we, if this discussion will continue, it really needs to be a discussion about all the players in the value chain, including governments. Um, and uh, this decision is important in, in, in terms of the message that it sends around the world. In Europe, there is uh, coming up in the spring an election for the e European Parliament. And they, uh, everyone has been waiting to see what this decision would be. Uh, because it basically says, you know, is there justification to kind of go down this road? Um, perhaps on one side, it sort of says that the hard approach to net neutrality taken by a country such as the Netherlands is maybe not the best way to go. I think it supports more of what we would call a soft approach, which is practiced in the, in the Nordic countries, in Denmark and Norway, where there is a, a, a dialogue, there's a, the different parties come to the table and discuss the issues. Um, the idea there is that you should get consensus that uh, if you make a law, it's kind of a failure. You really need to have different parties interact and to discuss, uh, and then try to avoid making laws because you know they they have a lot of have a lot of problems. So um, so that I think is an important aspect from the international side. Um, the other interesting thing that I think this debate shows is that regulators in Europe, especially uh, around the world, they are in this reclassification discussion. It's really an opportunity to say, okay, are we regulating providers? Or are we regulating services? So if we're going to regulate voice, then we need to look at Google would be a voice provider, Skype would be a voice provider, that there will be new people uh, who would fall under the FCC jurisdiction. And if that is the case, I think it might change the energy to support these kinds of things. So historically, companies who avoided the scrutiny of the FCC would now be under their purview. Um, and so I think that, uh, so maybe that would definitely change the, the energy to go after these sort of things, um, but also maybe have a fair discussion about, you know, who's, um, you know, who is in the value chain, what are their actions, are they really creating customer harm, you know, what are the, the costs and benefits of these things. So, um, so in that, so I think, you know, in that way, we're, we are going in the right direction. Um, but. For, we have, perhaps in the meantime, given that this rule has been vacated, we will get some, a lot of evidence by the practices going on. And we will have a lot of data points to say, is there consumer harm? You know, right now we have AT&T sponsored data program running. Uh, I think we, we, we don't really know yet whether it will go anywhere. But if it becomes a success, we have a great opportunity to see, you know, consumers chose this program, who benefited, and so on. So, uh, um, so at any rate, so that would be something we can definitely pay attention to and and review uh, at the next stage. Richard, you're next, but I'm I'm going to jump in. We have a question from Howard Buscourt, which kind of fits in the the discussion here, but I'll let you address it specifically. Um, the question goes very specifically to Chairman Wheeler uh, and our assessment of the likelihood that he will go down the Title II path and actively consider the prospect of reclassifying uh, broadband service as a, as a Title II service. Um, I, don't, I have no way of knowing how, how Chairman Wheeler is going to react to this. Um, he's made some kind of contradictory statements in the last couple of weeks uh, regarding internet regulation at Ohio State. He said some things that were fairly deregulatory, but <clears throat> in Oakland and Silicon Valley last week, uh, especially in Oakland, he, he made some comments that were kind of more on, uh, on the regulatory side. I think that uh, the way he's probably, it, the way I would advise him to approach it is to think about the particular outcomes that he wants to see happening in the internet space. Uh, I know he's a big believer in competition, as I think most of us are, and so that, that's a place to start. The, 
the court didn't uh, didn't say anything negative or didn't take away any any of the basis for the uh, the principles of internet freedom that the FCC has articulated. You know this, and recall this began with uh, Chairman Powell's four freedoms uh, of the internet. Uh, to run the application of your choice, to connect a device of your choice, uh, etc. The FCC added a couple of more to that in the in the course of developing the open internet rules. So, as a template for policy, you know the internet freedom remains as a concept certainly intact. There's questions about how you operationalize it, but uh, Chairman Wheeler's also said that the FCC's need to enact regulations is related to efforts that the industry makes on its own to eliminate the need for regulations. So he says it's like a seesaw, right? That if the if the industry's doing a great job of coming up with the right practices through consensus that enable innovation to flourish, enable competition in the application space to flourish, then there's no need for the agency to get into the mix and to, and to adjust the, the scales. But if he sees a, um, a failure of these positive outcomes to take place, then he, he actually had, now has a very powerful weapon that he can use to go into the space and to, and to change the dynamics. So I think his evaluation is going to be a largely fact-based. Uh, I would I would probably discourage him from getting too political about it. I mean, the FCC is, in theory, an expert agency that's supposed to be immune from the day-to-day you know, -day dynamics of the political system. And of course, we all know that's not the reality and hasn't been for 50 years. Uh, <clears throat> and it, this is an election year, and there is a, there is a uh, an action pending in the in the House to uh, actually revise the Communications Act and sort of resolve the uncertainty. Um, and so I, I think it'll be interesting to see what he does. And I hope he I hope he doesn't move too rashly, but takes a, a sober assessment of the dynamics of the marketplace. Let, let me add just one thought on that myself. So I. I uh teach this issue at the George Mason Law School as part of a class on regulated industries and um, one of the aspects that uh, we've covered in uh, in the class over the last few years uh, has been the so-called third way uh, or uh, plan B path that the FCC uh, offered uh, during the course of its deliberations over the open internet order. Um, which was a reclassification approach. They uh, specifically put on the table and asked for comments on reclassifying internet service, uh, broadband service as a title to telecommunication service. And then uh, the notion was that you would do that and then you would carve out some exemptions. Um, and I think I would encourage people who are interested in that from a substantive perspective to go back and, and look at it. And I would just say as a as a uh, as somebody who teaches that pretty regularly, that idea collapsed in uh, 2009, I think it was, of its very much of its own weight, um, because what it became very quickly became apparent that once you classified a service as a Title II service, that the entire panoply of um, public utility regulation, I use this as an epithet, uh, nothing wrong with public utility regulation of natural monopolies, um, but that the entire panoply of rules would apply, and it would be very difficult, probably probably legally impossible for the FCC to carve out exceptions, which everyone agrees that kind of the full package of public utility rate of return regulation, you know, shouldn't apply. Um, so I, I think there's a real question about the workability of that. It's one of those ideas that kind of maybe sounds good on the surface, but if you were paying attention four or five years ago when the FCC was writing these rules, um, you realize that that idea has kind of been market tested and didn't fare well. Uh, when when it was, um, but bet you look like you may want to. Yeah, uh, I want to on, on that so. because I could not agree more. This uh, case in particular looks like that's exactly what the court is saying: that you can't pick and choose, and uh, it's fine. Perhaps they're signaling that it's fine if you want to reclassify, but when you reclassify, you're going to get everything. Put that with the exception: Congress themselves. Congress themselves can carve out and, and add sort of statutory uh, specific uh, goals or uh, regulate for specific problems. Uh, even, even the regulator themselves might look at very, very specific problems, but that's very different than reclassifying it in its entirety as, as common carrier.
uh, the, it is does seem like an all or nothing in this case, uh, and that would be consistent with past precedent. Uh, Brett, Richard Roslin, or, or Brett and Roslin, I guess you haven't weighed in on this question. Uh, any any thoughts on this before we move ahead? Well, just uh, just briefly, from a very sort of factual basis, I just think it would be odd, not to mention misguided, for um, a regulator to reclassify what has become a you know sprawling worldwide network of computers in an information economy to say we're just going to put a label on that and say uh, we're just we're saying this is like the old telecom phone network um, you know these are information services and um, uh, I just think that that sort of blunt action would uh, sort of uh, violate our what we viscerally know about this clearly information network So, uh, I'm nothing more on that. Uh, or, or I don't know which question we're on, Jeff. You'll have to re refresh my refresh my memory. So, I so right, let's, 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 let's move on to one last question. I was uh, had muted myself, and uh, we'll go down this in alphabetical order again. So uh, we will start with. Uh, uh, we will start with, uh, 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 sorry, we will start with Richard and then go to Babette uh, 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 and um, Roslyn and Brett. Um, so the question is this, um, rarely do regulatory issues play into national political debates. Uh, kind of a big exception to that has been the, um, the follies down in Australia uh, where their efforts to spend $40 billion building a national fiber network have, were both very popular when they started and have uh, played a role in the defeat of the of the labor coalition in the most recent election when that plan failed. Um, uh, but that's, that's a rarity. But in the United States in 2008 and 2012, net neutrality actually was the sort of the dominant, uh, if not regulatory issue, certainly internet issue uh, in the political debate. Uh, President Obama famously said no one will get to the um, you didn't say left, but no one will get to go further than me on net neutrality, um, and uh, took a position on that issue. Um, so my question for each of you is looking down the road three years, um, as we're thinking about internet policy issues three years from now, um, what will uh, what will be the dominant issue, or more to the point, will net neutrality still be a dominant issue? And, and before I uh, before I let you answer, uh, I want to say for our viewers uh, that and listeners that um, on Friday morning, uh, AEI is sponsoring an event with many of the folks here uh, on tech policy predictions for 2014. Uh, so if you're interested in that, go to the uh, AEI.org website, click on the events tab, uh, and you'll see our event coming up for Friday. That, of course, will be webcast. And um, I guess some of those predictions will, uh, we won't have to be predicting what the net neutrality ruling from the D.C. Circuit will be. We can wipe that off <laughs> one off the list. Uh, but, uh, but I will ask you now to predict uh, where are we going from here in terms of the net neutrality debate and to put mm. some sharpness on that. You know, is this going to be something that candidates, political candidates are talking about in 2016? Um, yeah, I, would, I went to the uh, town hall meeting that Chairman Wheeler held in Oakland last week. Uh, in which some 30 community-based organizations, uh, apparently in, in Oakland, about every 500 citizens have an organization. Uh, they they came out to to essentially make 90-second statements to the to the chairman, and he took really copious notes and then responded to some of them after uh, 30 people or so had had done that. I was really struck by the fact that that uh, most. Of the people who who were in that in that group uh, didn't have anything to say about net neutrality. There were people that were complaining about things as diverse as uh, the possibility that cell phones cause brain tumors. There were people that didn't want to lose their landlines. Uh, there were people that wanted uh, broadband to be cheaper. There were people that wanted housing to be cheaper. But you know the the mentions of net neutrality were were actually quite few and far between, and I think this is this is an issue that has really never excited the public. 
It certainly did, as, as Jeff pointed out, play a role in the 2008 presidential election because the early support that really made Obama a viable candidacy was support from the net roots, which is sort of the the left version of the Tea Party. It's sort of the nervous fringe that you know that sees monsters behind every corner. And his uh, his commitment to net neutrality was something that that uh, encouraged people like Marcos Milicis to to come out and support his candidacy, made him a viable candidacy, and he prevailed over you know as we all know over the consensus pick at the time, who was uh, Hillary Clinton. I don't really see so, but I don't really see net neutrality playing a dominant role in the presidential campaign uh, that comes up in a couple of years. I think the public is really more concerned about making sure that they have networks that are good, fast, and cheap. They want to make sure that they have a variety of handsets to choose from. They want to make sure that they have a lot of apps. They probably want to make sure their kids don't spend too much time on the internet. Uh, they probably uh, probably are starting to get really annoyed by all the ads on the internet and how difficult it is to actually access content because it's buried behind so many layers of, of tracking and, uh, and advertising. Um, but, you know, as far as preserving an open Internet goes, certainly the NSA, there's no bigger champion of an open Internet than the NSA. I mean, it's got to make their job easier uh, when information is freely accessible to anyone who wants it at any time. So, no, I, I think there, there certainly will be people who are trying to keep, to make this into a, an issue that really excites the popular imagination, but I think it's something that the, the average voter is profoundly disinterested in. Well, it's always hard, hard to follow Richard, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I, and I'm notoriously bad at predicting what might be important. But again, I also uh, echo what Richard said. It seems to have elicited a lot of fervor, a lot of heat in in very limited areas. Sort of the policy wonks and tech geeks and you know I count us among it but as far as uh, popular culture I I don't know if I really see this as a be-all and, and end-all and part of it is what uh, Rosalind alluded to earlier is that in the time before 2016 we are going to have a great deal more data points about where innovation is taking us and where it might take us and I think as we get that and people see what providers can give them and the innovation and business plans they might be increasingly less sympathetic to need for um, top-down regulation uh, so I, I don't anticipate it would be a huge issue unless uh, something intervenes in the uh, before 2016 Roswell. Yes. Well, what I would say is regardless, uh, well, whatever the future brings, uh, in terms of our leadership today, I don't think we could ask for a better leader of the FCC than Tom Wheeler. Uh, I think this man is above reproach. Uh, he is not a shill for anyone. He is probably the most qualified person who could ever have this job. Um, so, you know, is there a question, would an election er era, would he be to one side or the other? You know, even though he has supported the Democrats, I don't think he's going to pander to them. He has so much integrity and, you know, he's been through so much in his career that he doesn't have to do that. So I'm, in fact, quite confident that, that Tom Wheeler, as a chairman, he's the kind of person that can hear you know, both sides of the issue, multiple sides, just as what Richard said, you know, so without uh, having to, um, how would we say, compromise his values. So in terms of the leadership, I think we're definitely in a good place. Um, and in terms of issues to animate, uh, it's funny, um, I will have to agree, when I speak with some of the net neutrality organizations in Europe, they said they have a very hard time getting support for net neutrality. It's not an exciting issue. Um, but NSA really gets people going. So, <laughs> you know, I think one of the exciting things here is there's a lot of um, journalists and the policy community, you know, uh, find new things. I mean, what I'm excited about is what will the next Tim Wu be? To, what's, what's he going to invent? I want to invent it, you know, whatever this new uh, term is going to be uh, going forward. Um, but maybe we can see net neutrality is kind of perhaps come to the end of its life, um, we can let it rest in peace, uh, but we'll certainly have something new. 
in, in terms of a presidential campaign, uh, definitely broadband is broadband's a, a huge issue everywhere. NSA is definitely an issue. Um, but I think this. I think one of the things that we can probably feel good about is that, to a large extent, because of the complexity, that just like in so many other ways, we have to leave the that we can. I don't say trust is not the right word. That we can allow the parties who need to manage networks, we can let them do their jobs. And and that has been shown that, you know, that the people who manage networks, they're not trying to hurt us. They're not out to, you know, it's not a business model that you can hurt your customers. It doesn't last. It's not sustainable. You know, shareholders don't want that. They don't want to be party to that kind of business model. So um, we're definitely going to be entering a new chapter here. And uh, I'm really excited to be uh, with, with this fantastic group because we, we will be uh, uh, navigating it together. Well, Brad, Brad, you're going to get the last word on this topic, and then we'll wrap up. All right. I agree with the others. I, I think with all the information and content and apps flooding into our lives, it's probably unlikely that the broad public will uh, determine that we don't have a generally open Internet, and so I don't think this will be a political issue. I think it's more likely healthcare and the economy and other things will dominate, although po politics is... Uh, always unpredictable. I would say that, you know, looking over the next couple of years, I think there will be more issues that are tied in with information technology, um, like healthcare. We saw the recent FDA action on 23andMe, like um, drones that, you know, have surveillance capabilities, like self driving cars that are connected to the internet. Um, and all sorts of new devices and sensors that have implications for privacy and so forth. I do think that there are going to be a host of regulatory issues, and the, the public may not see them exactly that way, but there are going to be a host of these issues where IT um, intersects with various different parts of the economy and society that will pop up, and I think there increasingly there are going to be a lot of these. So um, who knows what will provoke sort of a popular response and will become a political issue, but I think there are going to be a number of those. All right. Well, Brett, thank you, and, and thank you to everyone who participated today. I, I will offer my my own prediction very briefly, and, and that is that, um, uh, and, I, and I hope particularly the media folks who are watching us today will take this to heart. Um, uh, we're about to conduct an experiment of what happens in a world in which there are no FCC non-discrimination and non-blocking rules. Um, net neutrality advocates have argued that in such a world uh, it would be um, uh, that there would be all sorts of negative consequences both for speech and for commerce. Um, and what I hope we'll all keep our eye on over the course of the next year or two as we conduct this natural experiment is whether those predictions are right or wrong. You know the truth is um, a stern master, uh, maybe all of us on this uh, on this hangout uh, you know have been wrong all along and we'll now see um, the inability to access the website of your choice, the, the uh, all sorts of business models that squeeze out competition and so forth. Uh, my prediction is that that won't happen, uh, and uh, and for that reason, um, that uh, the political win will indeed come out of the out of the net neutrality uh, balloon, uh, uh, and also that as we've talked about a little bit, there's some other. Uh, threats to the internet that we ought to be concerned with that don't uh, don't have much to do with uh, uh, commercial internet service providers. So with all that, uh, again, I want to thank um, uh, Brett and uh, Rosalind and Richard and Babette for participating. Again, uh, we will be doing an event uh, Friday morning uh, at AEI, uh, which we'll be talking no doubt about this issue. Uh, also, I understand President Obama is going to be announcing uh, some reforms to the NSA on um, uh, Friday morning, uh, and we'll be talking about those as well. So uh, visit AEI.org, sign up for the webcast of that, or come visit us in person if you're in Washington. Uh, and for now, that's all from uh, Tech Policy Daily and the Center for Internet Communications and Technology Policy.